Mike, the things you figured out and the things your team are working on changes the game completely. So my first question to you is, when trying to understand this mind-body connection, tell me, how has our understanding of the body changed fundamentally since your work has been done? Um, let's talk about like some of the textbooks we read. How is it different compared to what you've seen today? Well, um, th thank you so much. Uh, I, I want to say a couple of things. Um, I, you know, I want to be really careful. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to claim that uh, what we've done has already, you know, sort of uh, completely changed the way everybody thinks about these things, right? Uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, I think that a lot of thing, the things that I talk about are actually things that we, information that we've had for quite a long time. And, and I think part of what I do, certainly we do empirical work that, uh, that, that brings up new information, but I think part of what we're doing is recasting existing information in, in new ways. And so there are, you know, uh, the way we think about these things in many ways rests on amazing work that many other people have done, right? So I wanna, I wanna be really clear that the, 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 there's a lot of uh, important work that has been marginalized over the years. It's not just, you know, it's not just me and my, and my work. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, I think there are numerous uh, things that certainly I learned, you know, in 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 in, uh, in, in courses and, and that other people still learn today that um, we're going to have to revise in an important in an important way. And many of those things, th there are many, uh, but 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 they boil down to a couple of different um, really fundamental pieces. And one of those pieces is really taking evolution and embryonic development seriously. And when you take them seriously, what happens is that a lot of the uh, categories that we have been using that uh, in the way as, as we we've been using terminology as if it's if as if it demarcates really sharp, nice, clean categories that are telling us something important about the world. And these are there are many of these. Uh, there are, you know, there are uh, um, machine versus organism. Um, there are uh, people say, well, this is just physics and this is true cognition. Uh, there are uh, things where um, people say, well, this is, this is, these are neurons and this is everything else, right? And, and many of these distinctions are in fact, not what we think they are. They're, they're absolutely not sharp. There's a, there's a continuum there. And that continuum radically changes how we're supposed to think about these things. When you look at your work, I mean, electrical signals, <clears throat> how it can carry information. Mm. What are some of the implications that has for our understanding of the brain and our understanding of consciousness? Yeah, well, that's a, that's a big question. Um, I think I think fundamentally one of the things I mean we we draw a, a lot of inspiration from studies of the brain and neuroscience in general, and my firm belief is that neuroscience isn't about neurons uh, in an important way. Uh, you know, somebody I forget who it was, but somebody said mm, computer science isn't about uh, computers any more than astronomy is about telescopes, and I think that sort of thing is true here. Th there are deep principles of neuroscience that teaches something very important about all cells and and in fact beyond cells there are aspects of of the world um that that, that have nothing to do with cells that, that that are informed by neuroscience um and i think that one of the key uh ways to start thinking about this is to really ask ourselves where did neurons come from and and all these cool tricks that brains do that we study in behavioral science and so on where did they come from you know neurons didn't just appear out of nowhere they basically uh optimized dynamics that that had been used in use long before brains um by uh, um, evolution discovered the beauty of electrical networks somewhere around the time of bacterial biofilms it's been electrical communication and information processing has been around for a very, very long time. And there's some beautiful, uh, there's some beautiful work on that in, in bacterial biofilms. And then since then, so we really need to understand what, you know, what, when, when, when this kind of computational system became exploited by brains to control muscle and to move the body through three dimensional space for various exercises of behavior and intelligence and so on, the, prior use of that exact same dynamic which evolution just sort of pivots from one problem space to another was 
um, was to uh, navigate the body through morphous space. So to control, instead of controlling muscles to move you through three-dimensional space, what, what this whole system used to be for prior to that, and I mean, it still works there too as well, is to uh, guide uh, the configuration of the body through anatomical configurations, embryonic development, regeneration, um, cancer suppression, those things. So what we see from this, we see many interesting things, but one of the things that we see from this is that we really need to understand intelligence in a much more broader sense. So whereas right now we can see, for, you know, in the, throughout the animal world, we can see intelligence in behavior. So we see animals moving around and doing things. We're very good at recognizing that, right? And in general, our, um, our perceptual systems are really good at noticing agency in the world. You know, if you're running around in the savanna somewhere, you really need to understand, am I looking at a rock? Am I looking at a tiger? Am I like, what, what's the, well, what can I expect from this object that I'm looking at? Am I looking at a conspecific, a potential mate, a potential rival? You need to understand these things. What, what we're not good at at all is to see intelligence in unconventional problem spaces because all of our senses point outwards. Imagine, imagine, that, um, imagine if we were born with, a, with an architecture where at any point in the day, you could actually feel uh, the way that we see you have another sense and this sense was, was telling you exactly what your pancreas was doing at any given moment in time and what all the chemical uh, situations that it was dealing with and all the different uh, physiological properties we would then be very uh, clear that this is as a kind of intelligence that it's solving problems it probably has memory it's doing all these interesting things we would know what it's like to be intelligent in physiological space if we could feel our gene expression changes we would know what it's like to solve problems in transcriptional space right metabolic space so uh you know we, we're just not very good at that right and 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 thinking about what did this dynamic uh do before what did the body think about before it thought about moving around in three-dimensional space i think it opens up all sorts of you know all sorts of interesting research questions you say so many things that are so intriguing at the moment but just to touch on that intelligence how would you then define intelligence when you can see that there's a plethora of different types of I mean, when you look at trees for example the way they communicate and you see how fungus yeah. sort of intervene with that communication how would you define intelligence knowing what you know? yeah yeah, um, and I'll say two things. I'll say uh, I'll give you a specific definition that I like, but but I first want to uh, make a kind of a philosophical point. I want to be clear that all of these things I'm saying are not meant to be the correct way to look at things. In fact, I strongly believe that a lot of the things that we want to, let's say, measure or estimate or, or understand intelligence, cognition, um, uh, the boundaries of the self in, in an environment, all of these things, I think in an important way are observer dependent. Right? And, and now one of the observers may be the system itself, right? So, so everybody has, every agent has, has a self model of, to some extent of what it's doing in the environment. Um, and the claim isn't that every perspective is as good as any other perspective. That's not what I'm saying. Uh, but I am saying that there are multiple valid perspectives and what makes a perspective go um, uh, good or, or not so good is the degree to which it enables, n facilitates new research, new hypotheses, new capabilities, right? So when I give you a definition of intelligence, what I expect is that it will do some useful work for us. And it's perfectly fine that somebody else has a completely different definition of intelligence, as long as it does some useful work in, in a different context. Okay. So my definition of intelligence has to, uh, has to do with uh, competency in problem solving. So there is some, some space in which there are regions that are uh, preferred and regions that are not preferred. In that space, it might be physiological states. And so, so one of the things that I do with intelligence is I, I take off all the constraints on what the space is. So, so it, I'm not, it, it's not just three-dimensional space moving around. It's not just linguistic space as humans can do. It is all sorts of problem spaces. And there are regions that are preferred. There are regions that are not preferred. And your intelligence is the system's ability to navigate from the regions it doesn't like to the ones that it wants to be in with some degree of competency. Now, what does competency mean? It might be that you avoid local minima. It might be that you have patience to go further away from your goal in order to have, in fact, reach it if there are some, you know, some, some local barriers. It might be that you have more memory. It might be that you have some modeling capacity so that you actually have some internal understanding of what that space is. 
It might be that you have advanced metacognition and that you know you're searching the space. If you're a human, you know you know what you're doing. Um, so, so all of those things. Now, this is where we hit the, the, the role of the observer again, because then an immediate question comes up, but how do you know what the problem space is? Right? Who decides what the problem space is? And I think that's exactly the point. I think if, you're, if, if you believe that there is um, one sort of objective ground truth about what the system is doing at any given point, you've got major problems to be, to be able to say what that is. I, I have a different view. I think that any observer can impose their own particular lens on, on that system and see how it fits. If you think it's solving a particular problem, see what that does for you. Does that, does that help you control the system? Does that help you relate to the system to understand it, to predict what it's going to do next? If, you're, if your model is terrible, you'll know soon enough that that's not working. But, uh, but two different people can be looking at exactly the same system and both have useful perspectives on what problem it's solving, you know, what capacities it has, and they can be extremely different. You know, a human brain makes a great paperweight. And so if, if you're looking at the problem space of, of, of you know, keeping, um, uh, keeping a bunch of papers from flying away in the wind, uh, you can say that, well, here's a pretty good solution. You, you know, the brain is able to do that. And then somebody else say, yeah, fair enough, but you're missing a, you're missing a whole other set of capacities that this thing has, right? And I think that's super, super crucial because in all of these arguments about whether it's something, and I, and I hate this binary thing again, but, but people argue is, you know, is something intelligent and whatever. Anytime you make a claim about a system's intelligence, you are taking an IQ test yourself. Okay? You are revealing your own capabilities or lack thereof of picking a good problem space and being a clever observer and saying, wow, this thing doesn't look like it's doing much. I mean, it's a tree. It doesn't, in three-dimensional you know, motion space, it's doing almost nothing. But you know, if I were to look at the, at the, at the uh, physiological space, I see these amazing things that it's doing in terms of handling novelty. And, and again, intelligence doesn't mean, you know, um, staying alive is, is something, but intelligence usually involves you're, you're able to solve new problems. You're able to uh, come up with, uh, you know, all kinds of, all kinds of solutions to difficult uh, tasks. So, so yeah, we have to be clear that as an observer, when you make an intelligence claim about something, you're also saying something about how clever you are or aren't in noticing it. It sort of reminds me of the Turing test. I mean, in a sense, yeah. you're trying to figure out consciousness. It's, it tells us more about us than it does about anything else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I think that's very fair. Yeah. And along those lines, then, when it comes to artificial intelligence, what are your thoughts on that? What are your thoughts on our current, currently where, we were, where we're at and where we might go? Do you think that artificial intelligence <clears throat> might become um, a sort of conscious being at some point? Yeah, so so there's there's three different questions there. Um, you know, there's at the, at the end there's a question about consciousness, which is a whole other thing we we can talk about. There's a question of uh, what uh, what what the state of AI is right now, and then there's a question of you know sort of what are the what are the foundational um, thoughts about what it can and, and can't do, right? Let's, I'll, I'll, I'll let's start off with consciousness. What if, to you, what is consciousness? Um, Let's, uh, if, if you don't mind, let's, let's get to that last actually, because, because uh, it, it's, it's a very interesting thing, but, but I feel like um, I have the least uh, useful things to say about it, but, but I think I can, I can say something useful about the other parts. Um, this question of, uh, you, and, and, and inevitably we, we, people, people every, every, every month there, there, there are papers saying that, you know, um, artificial, uh, artificial constructs can't do this, can't do that, you know, they, they won't have true, you know, whatever. Let's, the, the, I think we can dispel all of this in a very kind of simple, logical way. And, and I, and I want to do that in two ways. The, the really important concept that underlies this and the way that we should think about this stuff. This, there's a concept of chimerism. Chimerism is simply the idea that everything is made of parts, especially uh, cognitive agents are all, we're all collective intelligences, we're all made of parts. And very interesting things happen when you consider how to mix these parts. Now they can be mixed in two ways. They can be mixed spatially in, in space and they can be mixed temporally in time. I'm gonna give you very simple examples of what I mean by that. Let's just look at, uh, you know, if, if consciousness, cognition, um, first person perspective, if, if those words mean anything at all, then humans have them that I guess that's uncontroversial to some extent, right? If those words are, you know, we are a good example of that if, if those words are to mean anything. And yet, all of us started life as a bag of chemicals that became one cell, the fertilized egg. And we all took this journey from something everybody today would pretty much call just physics, right? A bunch of chemical reactions. 
and some number of years later you've got this this being that starts to make pronouncements about its own you know cognition and how it's different from machines and how no machine can do this and that well guess what you used to be a bag of chemicals and the important so this is a temporal chimera because over time you're changing you're changing in time never mind the evolutionary uh, this, this is exactly the same argument can be made about the evolutionary time scale we all used to be amoebas basically but but at this point right uh the point is that uh, here, here's the important part where, where the biology is really helpful and where where developmental biology we have to take seriously developmental biology offers no privileged time point at which some some lightning bolt flashes and true cognition enters the the organism there is nothing like that is a very slow gradual process you start off with a single cell then you're a ball of cells then some of those cells decide they're going to stretch out and become electrically excitable and then they sort of elaborate and then you start moving around and it, all of these steps you can sit there and watch this happen uh, for, for with with you know frog embryos and so on which we do uh, you know in our lab and and it is very clear that the journey from just physics to whatever whatever we mean when we say here's a full-fledged advanced this you know self-referential cognitive cognitive system is a slow journey so when someone says to me that artificial systems can't do this or that uh immediately with the the um the the ball is in their court to specify what is it that synthetic bioengineering isn't going to be able to reproduce i mean pre you know pre molecular pre-evolution you could be uh, for forgiven for thinking that, okay, there's something just fundamentally special about us because Adam named all the animals in the Garden of Eden. They're all different. They're all distinct, uh, you know, kinds of species. And we're just, you know, we're just special. Okay. But now we see that this is basically a, se a series of steps. We now understand that evolution is this meandering hill climbing search through, by, by, driven by random mutation and some other stuff, but, 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 but largely largely uh un unguided and as a result it, it 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 created us do we really not think that engineers can can do better than the random walk i i you know i think that it's uh because of course because the the, the nice thing for, for engineers is that we get to use both if we want to use evolutionary techniques we can and people do use evolutionary computation evolutionary uh, design all the time so we can do we can do that we can do better than that you know as engineers we have we can we can do way better than that so whatever it is that you think led up to and, I, and by the way i've never seen this is why I, I like a continuum view for almost everything because i've never seen a um a convincing argument for some special step that happens you know by the way on day 27 booms you know then that, now cognition kicks in I've, I've never heard a good argument for that so uh whatever it is that slowly ratchets you up to a conscious system there's no reason why engineers couldn't replicate that right either from existing parts or so so that's the temporal chimera right so so just the fact that understanding that that uh that that existence uh is is a slow it's it's we don't wink into you know we don't we don't wink into into existence it's just a slow development um and uh that that's the temporal side now now there's a spatial side if you tell me that let's just imagine here's 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 a game um you don't believe you don't believe that uh that computers can have whatever consciousness has so so imagine you've got you've got uh two 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 houses on the street in the first house there's a there's a person and this person has a a, a chip implant uh because he, he uses it to drive a wheelchair and maybe a vacuum cleaner and some other stuff it's you know it's got a little bit of onboard ai but and it's plugged into his brain and so what you're looking and and so we have this today this exists today and what you're looking at is a is, as a creature that's let's say 98 percent human two percent robotics okay over in the next house you've got a Roomba you know some sort of some sort of the household the vacuum cleaning robot that has some human uh some human cells cultured in a little culture chamber that 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 does something that is helpful to the to the to the robot it you know helps it see be you know um uh, identify edges or something right so that thing that thing is 98 percent robot two percent human so now if you think you, you you see where i'm going with this if you think that there's a fundamental distinction here i'm going to tell you that i can make a chimera at every point along that continuum you want 60, 60, 40, you want 70, 30, we can make any combination that you want. And if you think there's a fundamental difference, you have to say that, oh, well, once you hit 
now you're right ridiculous there's, there's no way so so because of this chimerism and because i've never heard of a good argument for any kind of uh, sharp line that comes down i think that it is fundamentally unsupportable to say that artificial um constructs cannot have what we are because because there's no good what what is an artificial construct it's some some combination of evolved and uh evolved and designed material and why would you think that that uh, that can't be at least as good as what raw evolution does? We can do all of that, and and we can do more. So I think, um, and in fact, you you see that, uh, and I, I think anybody who's had kids uh, and watches them uh, d d watches them develop can see this. When they start out, little kids, when they when they're talking, they're just little. St you you can see it. They they're just trying stuff out to see what happens. They're little statistical, like probabilistic learners. Exactly the same. In in fact, in fact, I have a, I have a, a project uh, that we're starting with a colleague where you look at um you look at uh, uh, verbal output from children and from from modern AIs, and good luck telling the difference. They they sound little kids sound exactly like what what modern. If you take two chatbots and set them to talk to each other at that that weird kind of like conversation that they have where they sort of are using the words right, but the the, the sense you know the sense isn't there. That's exactly what little kids sound like, and. Uh, and and so and so you start out there, and then slowly, right? Nobody comes down and implants, you know, the the co the, the cognitive chip in there. They they just sort of slowly roll into uh, being creatures that you would say, oh, you're not just using words; you actually understand what you're saying. That's a slow process. It take it take it takes it several years. So so anyway, so ba so based on all that, I think I think it's it's completely unsupportable to draw some kind of line between so-called artificial and uh, and natural intelligence. I think that absolutely we will have a first hybrid and then just completely synthetic constructs that have uh, that ha that have the kinds of things that humans and animals uh, that animals have. When, when you look at certain animals, which animals do you believe share the most in common with us in terms of cognition, uh, volition, action, hmm. intelligence? Uh, boy, that's an interesting question. Uh, it's 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 a I, I don't know. Um, I think that I mean, the most important thing I can say here is that I think we are all on a continuum. I don't, I don't believe that, you know, certain people worry about where does intelligence show up or where, you know, where does, and it, we have to make certain markers for policy reasons, you know, for, for animal use committees, for research, for courts, uh, for things like that, right? So, so we have to draw lines. Those lines are very much like when you say that an 18 year old is an adult, what does that mean, right? That doesn't mean anything. Nothing happens when you turn 18, but we have to sort of do that and we all have to pretend it's real be just to kind of for life to keep going. I think intelligence and cognition are that way. I think paramecia and, and single cells, and in fact, even subcellular components have some of the sort of minimal ingredients of what you would call intelligence. And they, those get scaled up and cranked up in a way that, that we then recognize as, you know, very complex uh, self-referential metacognition and so on. Um, you know, which ones are the most like humans? I have no idea, but, but I think that, um, I think one, one thing that is interesting is that all of our ethical and legal, uh, frameworks are built around this faulty idea of there being a, um, a clear line, you know, in court, there's a thing called diminished capacity, right? So, so if you're not whatever a standard human is supposed to be, you get some, you get some breaks of, in terms of uh, being responsible for your actions and some things like that. But, but all of that assumes that there's a, that there's a single dimension, right? And you're either, you're either in that zone or, or, or you're not. And what's coming, I think, for, for uh, cer certainly, you know, certainly in your lifetime, what I think you're going to see is a proliferation of various kinds of agents that will make um you know darwin's uh, endless forms most beautiful look like a like like a tiny little you know little dot on a giant uh, space of creatures we're going to have you know cyborgs and hybrids and and synthetic you know synthetic animals and bioengineered critters and humans you know merged with other things all of this is is coming and all of these creatures are going to have not only minds that are either more or less uh, uh you know of, of capacity greater or smaller than ours but in fact very different they're going to be they're going to be just extremely different in their cognition and um and that means two things that means that we are going to have first of all it means that we're going to have to develop 
frameworks for relating to people, uh, to, 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 to agents that are not based on what do they look like and how they got here. Right. Meaning that in the past, it was pretty easy. You can sort of if you if you were confronted with something and you wanted to know what its status was, you could walk over and you sort of knock on it. And if you hear a metallic clanging sound, you could conclude some things. You could say, OK, this came off a of factory. It's probably pretty boring. I don't need to be ethically worried about what I'm going to do to it. Um, you know, I can take it apart if I need to. Uh, those kinds. Of, and and conversely, if you sort of felt like 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 a warm, you know, sort of um, furry thing you would say aha uh-huh, this is a natural pro- natural uh, natural animal it probably has uh, you know uh, feelings uh, maybe it's, it's human and it has hopes and dreams and i'm supposed to treat it in a particular way uh that's that's going to be gone so this distinction of whether something is is evolved or designed is going to mean nothing and what something looks like where before you could say you know somebody gives you something you say well that kind of looks like a fish uh, genetically, it's some kind of fish. I know, I know what we can expect of fish. I know how to treat this thing. That's going to be gone. You're going to have things that are absolutely nowhere on the phylogenetic tree of life. And we're going to have to come up with ways to recognize intelligence, to decide w- what we expect of them and what we owe all of these creatures that are not like us at all. Right. So that's, you know, that's, that's kind of a, that's kind of a key thing, um, that we're going to have to work out. What I've realized, so when I started this podcast, I mean, the main goal is obviously just to try and figure out uh, an answer to the mind-body problem. What is consciousness? What is this relationship between the mind and the body? And a lot of people, when they, particularly philosophers, when they make their theories, a lot of them tend to neglect this sort of, this evolutionary story. And yeah. when you think about it, I mean, ideally, when you're talking about even just a neuron, you have to think of it as its own animal cell. I mean, this is... yeah. All yeah. evolved separately, and yeah. a lot of your work has shown now that even in encoding, when we encode the DNA to make certain cells or to replicate and do whatever it has to do to make certain proteins or whatever, there's more going on now. There's there's the electrical signals that are also transmitting messages. So talk to us about that because this is something that fundamentally changes the game, and this is the element I was talking about earlier. So yeah. just tell us more about that. Yeah, yeah, and and it has two two important parts. The first part is kind of generic, and and then I'll I'll talk about um, what the bioelectricity has to do with it. The the generic part is that um, uh, all all of life is uh, is based on a multi scale competency architecture, and what what I mean by that is that not only is it I mean everybody knows it's kind of nested dolls of molecules make cells, make tissues, make organs, you know, swarms. Everybody knows that. But but there's something more important going on here. What's more important is that all of those pieces are the parts are themselves competent in and and have a degree of basal intelligence in certain problem spaces, right? So 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 molecular networks, cells, tissues, they're all they're all they all have agendas. And what the big sort of mystery of of life, I think, and and of a lot of science, is to understand the scaling. Because what happens is is very interesting. You take a bunch of cells that are competent in solving cell level problems, meaning they have cell level preferences, homeostatic uh, set points, and they will work hard to, to set you know, internal pH and hunger level, manage hunger levels, all these, they have little, they have, they have goals and they have little cell level goals. Somehow they come together and they start to pursue much larger goals. For example, the goal of rebuild, the goal of building a limb. You know, so if you're a bunch of salamander cells, even though you used to be a long time ago, you used to be amoebas in an important sense. Now you work together to make something that no individual cell can comprehend. No cell knows what a finger is. No cell knows how how long a limb is supposed to be, but the collective does. So you have this emergent collective intelligence that will do very cool things. Like if, if, if um, uh, half of that uh, salamander limb gets bitten off, the cells will immediately get to work to rebuild it. They bring it back. It's very clear that it's a goal-directed system, of course, so because, because they keep exerting energy to get back to what they know is the correct pattern, and then they stop, right? That's the most amazing thing about regeneration is that it stops when, when the right pattern is there. Okay, so, so then, and then, and then all of those uh, get added up together, and there's a new emergent system that, at least in humans, becomes verbal and, and starts talking about, I, you know, I want this and I will do that. And, 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 and so you have this multi-scale, um, multi-scale uh, a hierarchy of agents which cooperate and compete and their goals are very different and they operate in different spaces, right? Uh, you, you know, you, you may go rock climbing and rub, rub a bunch of skin, uh, you know, a bunch of skin cells off of your hands. You never think about it again. 
right? Um, for for those skin cells, this is a <laughs> this is a disaster, and um, and uh, and and you may make choices about food and 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 alcohol and who knows what that that your organs uh, are may not be at all th- you know thrilled about, and they may have may fight very hard to regain their um, their their homeostasis, uh, you know, to to enable that to happen. So so that's so that's the first interesting thing is that there has to be some way for competent agents and by the way during embryonic development um this is not widely known but 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 during embryonic development the different organs and tissues they compete with each other they come even though they have identical genetics that 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 doesn't matter they compete for uh, metabolic resources for informational molecules there's a lot of competition that goes on through across and between these layers so we are Every, 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 certainly, people, you know, certainly humans and, and most other cognitive um, systems are walking uh, nested hierarchies of agents with their own agendas. And the, um, what we need to understand is how the, how the cognitive glue works. How is it that you can bind? And I have a story that I can tell about how I think it works. But, but the point is that um, they have to work together to scale little tiny goals into much larger goals. That's kind of the key question to all of this, right? Is this is the scaling? Now, here's where bioelectricity comes in. Um, I, I'm 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 not claiming that bioelectricity is the only way that that could happen. There may be creatures somewhere, you know, in a in a you know in a in a cloud of a chemical somewhere in the cosmos that do this in a completely different way. Okay, but 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 here on Earth, um, what evolution discovered is that bioelectricity is an incredibly convenient way to tie individual competent agents in a way that their goals scale up. And I can tell you, um, if you want to d- dig in that far, I can tell you how I think that happens. But, it, but, but what's important about bioelectricity is that it's not just, <clears throat> and I mean, we have, you know, of course, there are many um, uh, biochemical signals, uh, biomechanical signals. Uh, there are lots of ways that cells communicate. But what's really important about bioelectricity is that it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very convenient uh, medium for scaling uh, measurements, information processing, um, all, all kinds of all kind of computation, all kinds of things that that are really important for for scaling cognition. And so that's what I what I think the magic of bioelectricity is. It's not just another piece of physics that you have to keep track of to to understand development. It's actually the medium in which the collective intelligence of these groups is stored. Now that sounds kind of nuts when I when I talk about that w- with respect to skin cells and things like this. I they say, "Whoa, people, say, you know, uh, uh, the, the bioelectric gradient is a, is is a medium of a collective intelligence." It sounds bizarre and cosmic, but 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 in fact, what what is it that neuroscientists say about the brain? That's exactly the commitment of neuroscience, right? That you have a bunch of cells. We're all walking bags of cells, really, and uh, you have a bunch of cells, and and what binds those cells together into a novel entity with preferences, with goals, with, um, you know, uh, uh, all, all the first person perspective and so on. Well, it's bioelectricity, of course. So if you work it backwards, if you just ask the question of, well, when did this is an amazing trick, right? Evolution discovered an amazing uh, uh, architecture here. Well, when did that happen? Well, it happened a long time ago. So so that's what I think bioelectricity, the, the, the importance of bioelectricity is really, is as that is as that kind of cognitive glue um, far outside the nervous system. You said you were going to tell us why you think that happened. What? Oh, oh, uh, yeah. Um, here's uh, here's a here's a simple uh, it's a simple story. And 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 I should say, you know, uh, all of this is very early days. In other words, I expect that uh, the work that's going to come out on this is is going to be, you know, just is going to be. This is just the tip of the iceberg, I guess, is what I'm saying. But but I'll tell you what I what 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 I think now. Imagine um, imagine that you're a single cell. And you're a single cell, and uh, you are handling your own local cell level goals. We know you're doing this because otherwise you would be dead. I, I am not. I'm not addressing the origin of life. I don't really have anything smart to say about how the cells got here in the first place. I have no idea. So I'm just. I'm. I'm going to start. I'm going to start with unicellular organisms. You have. A, you have a single cell, uh, and you're handling various various things. You have. Uh, you have um, ways to store some memories of events that happened to you so physiological you know events of damage of of of, of stress of various other things and you can there's some actions that you can take and so on you can move around you can turn genes on and off and you can metabolize and so on okay so now imagine that uh there's a there's another cell uh nearby and one thing that um evolution has discovered uh, are are two really important 
uh, pieces of hardware that you can have. Those, those pieces of hardware are in your genome. So, so evolution provides you with this hardware in your genome. And it really is, um, it really is uh, you know, this distinction between hardware and software is, is, is very good because a lot of the things you're going to do with that hardware are not per se in the genome. It's just the hardware that's in the genome. And you've got two, in, there are two interesting things that are in that genome. One are voltage gated ion channels. Now the thing about, uh, and just in general uh, gated, it doesn't have to be voltage, but just in general gated ion channels, the amazing thing about them is that, think about a voltage gated ion channel. It's a voltage gated current conductance, meaning that the previous voltage state affects whether the channel is open or closed, which of course will move ions affect the voltage state. So you get this feedback loop. That's basically a transistor. A voltage gated current conductance is a transistor. Once you have that, you have feedback loops, you have historicity, you have memory, you, have, you can make logic gates, you can do anything, any, any of that stuff. So that's super powerful. The other thing that's super powerful is something that we call a gap junction. So a gap junction, what it is, is it's a set of, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a ring made up of a certain kind of protein and two rings from two adjacent cells can basically connect together. When that happens, something very interesting happens. Imagine, imagine uh, the, uh, two, two cells sitting, sitting next to each other. They don't have these gap junctions. They're just sitting there. And one cell secretes a signal, let's say a chemical signal, and it goes floating off and it hits the surface of the other cell. Now that recipient cell can tell very clearly that this signal comes from outside. So it's obvious and, and to, to, the, to that cell. And when it comes from the outside, now you have some options. You can ignore it. You can do something about it. You can trust it. You can not, not trust it. And many, you, you know where it's coming from. And, and one of the things that that enables you to do is to have a very clear boundary between you and world. Okay? You, know, you know what you know, and you know what's coming in from the outside. Okay? Now imagine that these two cells become connected with gap junctions. Mm -hmm. A signal that originates in one cell propagates through the gap junctions directly into the internal milieu of the second cell. Now, if that is a stress molecule or a calcium flux or some kind of a memory molecule that indicates a record, you know, some sort of engram that, that indicates that something happened, that molecule doesn't have any metadata on it to say where it came from. As far as that second cell is concerned, if it's a, let's say it's a, let's say it's a, it's a stress molecule, you look at that, you, all, the, all the downstream mechanisms you are now stressed out because you have you have this stress molecule. Now the experience may not have occurred to you; it may have occurred to your neighbor, but you don't know that. And so, what that does by by sharing? So, what do you share? You share stress, you share memories, you share physiological state. As soon as you start sharing all that stuff to the point where you can't tell where it came from, it erases the boundaries between you and your neighbor. It is impossible to keep a strong sense of self where all of your memories are shared. It's like a, you know, it's like a, it's like a mind melt basically, right? And from science fiction, it is impossible to have a strong boundary between those two cells when you're sharing the, you know, the consequences, the, the history of everything is shared now. So now you're starting to scale. So, so that, that wiping of ownership information starts to scale and that, and very interesting things happen then. First of all, you know, if you were tracking before then, let's say you were using game theory to track uh, who's going to cooperate, who's going to defect, right? Well, two cells connected by a gap junction, they can't help but cooperate because, because, you can't, because there's just you. There's not two cells now. There's one. You can't not cooperate with yourself. It's impossible. So, so, that, so that immediately drives this, this larger, this, this scaling of cooperation. It, um, the interesting thing with, uh, with, with stress, too, is stress is, is very, uh, very important here. Imagine that you have one cell that is uh, stressed because it needs to, it's over here but it needs to be over there and there's a bunch of cells in the way and it can't get where it's going let's say in the in the during let's say in during embryogenesis it needs to get over there it can't one thing it can do is it can start exporting its stress molecules and what i, I mean by stress is uh, molecular markers of the delta the error basically the error function between where where you're supposed to be that that homeostatic loop has an error function and there's and, and whatever the magnitude of that error that basically that's your stress so once you start exporting your stress to your neighbors, they also become stressed and it is in their best interest to fix the situation, not because they're being altruistic towards you, but because they would like to reduce their stress. So the sharing of stress molecules immediately cranks up this amazing cooperation because not because they have to somehow suddenly become uh, become altruistic, but just because they can't tell whose stress it is. So, so, so everybody's, everybody's stress level goes up a little bit, which means that everybody gets a little more plastic, willing to change, you know, change metabolism, change transcription, change positions. And that lets you 
your your problem is now is now everybody's problem and so they all start to sort of shift around a little bit to try and reduce the whole thing so 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 when cells get connected by this by this amazing electrical network and we're making some i mean i'm doing this in a very um kind of qualitative way but of course we you know we make computational models of this what happens to the think about um think about a a homeostatic loop there are three main parts to a homeostatic loop one take a measurement of whatever you care about two you have a memory of what it's supposed to be that's your set point so compare your measurement to that memory to that set point and then three based on that error do something or if the error is small don't do anything right so that's your basic you know that's a thermostat in your house that's your basic basic homeostatic loop and uh, uh cells that are connected into networks everything now scales when you take a measurement you don't just measure your state because you're connected to everybody you measure everybody's state so now you're taking a measurement of a giant uh, sheet of cells so now whereas before you could say what is uh you know what is what is the value of some parameter precisely at this cellular location now you're saying what does the whole tissue what's the what's what is this parameter in the whole tissue right it might be and it might be all kinds of all kinds of um information bearing uh kinds of uh measurements so you're so you're measuring a very large thing how about memory well now that you're connected into a bigger network your iq goes up because you've got that computational capacity you're not a single cell now you're a network of cells maybe you're a huge network maybe you've got layers right so so you so so now you're able to remember bigger things how about actions whereas before all you could do is act in a single cell location now the whole thing can act in large the sheet can deform it can move it can bend it can do all sorts of things so immediately these um these uh pieces of hardware that evolution provides you with enable you to scale your goals that's the key to this it's not you're not just getting bigger uh you know uh just just physically larger what it lay, and now allows you to do is to scale the goals that you are capable of pursuing and this is how you get go, you know the goals get bigger and bigger in terms of space and time and your memory bigger memory means your goals stretch further back and right it means they can stretch further forward you might have some predictive capacity even cells have some predictive capacity, but but networks have way more predictive capacity. So so the scaling of the goal. So that's 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 my story, and all of this is uh, you know this is a set of hypotheses that we're we're currently testing. So, so okay, so you're looking at the histological differences of some of the tissues, right? Let's say we're looking at differences between neural tissue and let's say cardiac tissue, for example. Those tissue networks. What are the fundamental differences, and how? How would your data now change how you perceive those differences? Yeah, um, the, for, the most important thing to say is that, uh, as I was saying before, we have just scratched the surface. So, so I'm certainly not claiming that we know what all the differences are, right? Yeah. This, is, this is what I'm suggesting is that there's a research program here that has never been properly followed that needs to start looking at this. Uh, one thing you might say is that Look, uh, nervous systems evolved for a reason. Animals with nervous systems are incredibly successful. There's got to be something that they do that's unique. And this is true. Of course, this is true. But um, we don't really understand all, all of that. So, for example, there is, there is a phenomenon known as cardiac memory. So, so, so heart tissue actually does, does, can form memories. It can be trained. It remembers things. Um, so there will be uh, features and architectures of the brain that are uniquely uh optimized for specific things one of the things they're uniquely optimized for is is uh, rapid action so you know basically what evolution did with bioelectricity was to really speed it up in neurons be, 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 both because of the architecture so now they're you know kind of long and skinny and you can make directed networks but also the myelination all, all the, the the action potentials encoding and the, the, the temporal as opposed to the spatial dimension all of that stuff is great when the competition is uh running around and trying to eat you and so and so right so now moving through three dimensional space has to be very fast moving in morphous space doesn't really have to be that fast development is slow and, it, and and it's okay development doesn't have to be that fast and so one of the key things so 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 here's a here's a fun exercise that i sometimes have my students do i'll say uh pick out pick out a paper uh, in neuroscience any paper uh take the paper stick it into import it into my, microsoft word and do a find replace and everywhere you see the word neuron, just replace that with the word cell. And everywhere where you see the word millisecond, replace that with hour or minute. And now read it. And now what you have is a, is a really interesting developmental biology paper. Um, because, because what that now suggests, right? So there's a symmetry here, right? There's, um, 
uh, there's a, there's an invariant where, you know, some things have changed, speed has changed and some other things, the time scale is different, but the architecture is a little different, but there are lots and lots of interesting symmetries there to explore. So I'm certainly not going to deny that brains do unique things. That's why we have them. They absolutely do unique things, but I am going to say that, um, the reason they do those unique things is not nearly as simple as everybody thinks. And we've had, I've been at, I've been at meetings in, uh, <clears throat> on basal cognition and, uh, and, th and, and things like this, where somebody will say, uh, well, you know, neurons, uh, you, you know, some, something, something neurons. And I will say, sorry, what's a neuron? And they'll say, well, come on, neurons. And I'm like, no, really, what's a neuron? And they say, well, here, I'll, I'll fine. I'll, and, and they put some, they put some uh, criteria on the board. Okay. Here, here are five things that, that are neurons. And say, well, every cell in the body does this. Now what? And so now, and so now we can argue for three hours about what do, do we know what are, what really a neuron is. And of course, you can you know people people who study uh, somebody a reviewer is once said um look uh, if you if you've taken neuroanatomy one hundred one everybody agrees on what a neuron is. True enough. For certain purposes, we can say neurons have a certain uh, transcriptional profile. They have a certain shape. They are those things fundamental uh, in some consequences in the contexts maybe. But they're not; those are not deep differences. Actually, um, it's really not entirely clear what what the magic is that's different. You know, what makes brains special? Yeah, because look, look, I just realized that obviously I know I've read your work and I've seen a lot of your talks. Um, but just for the listeners who haven't seen it, I mean, talk to us about this hardware software differentiation a little bit. Tell us how you figured that out because you, we're looking at DNA now as the hardware and you're looking at the electrical signals as the software component. Uh, how did you get to that conclusion? Yeah, um, well, a couple of things. Uh, the first is that, uh, just to remind everybody that, because uh, a lot of people get really upset when you port uh, analogies from one field to another, and people, there's a lot of people who don't believe that hardware and software are useful, um, you know, a useful uh, kind of a metaphor to use with, with living things. I will say this, much like any other metaphor, it has benefits and it has limitations. The it, but 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 if we if we under if we take computer science seriously and we are not claiming that living things are like today's computers meaning serial architecture meaning some guy sat down and programmed it and so there's a person that you know that that wrote out an algorithm but that but that's a very small uh, sector of computing devices right that's not what you know computer science is really about so if we if we sort of back off of that um, I think the hardware software distinction is very useful and I'll tell you how we think about it and then I'll describe uh, some experiments that we've done that that show the, the good thing I mean to me the value I mean I can sit here and philosophize all day about this stuff but what the value of all these frameworks is that they drive us to do experiments that we wouldn't have otherwise done okay so we've done lots of uh, we've reached novel capabilities in the lab that we would have that that we would not have reached and in fact nobody has reached if they weren't thinking this way you know and I think that's super crucial. That's why the, 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 the framework that I have uh, for all this, I call it TAME, T-A-M-E, which is technological approach to mind everywhere. It's a technological approach. It's not, we don't sit in, in you know, we, we don't sit in our armchairs thinking about that, you know, I really don't believe that thermostats have goals. Okay, it's fine what you believe and what you don't believe, but how about a framework that, get, that lets us do experiments so then we can actually answer, the, answer that question. So that's my, right? So, so, that's, so that's my framework. So um, the... Uh, You to go towards the how, how you got to that thought. I mean, let's talk about the yeah, time, for example. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the the a, a lot of people a lot of people think about uh, the DNA as the uh, as 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 the software, and then they say, well, the cell interprets it. That that's fine. That's a fine metaphor if what you're interested in is cell level phenotypes. So if you want to know how cells got the 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 enzymes and various other things they have, yeah, they 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 read the information in the genome and they made those proteins, right? So that, that's a great metaphor. If you want to think about anatomy, uh, you have to think in a completely different way because if we uh if you and a lot of people don't don't realize this let's let's ask um let's ask this this question uh you look at you look at an organism uh incredible complexity you know i often i often show i get this slide that's like a a cross section through a human torso i mean my god the complexity is unbelievable all this stuff is in the right place the right orientation where is that pattern specified and people will say well it's in the genome okay but we can read genomes now 
And so we know it's not in there because when you read the genome, you don't see any of that. You don't see the, the symmetry type of the organism, the size, the shape. You don't see any of that. What you see is descriptions of the micro level hardware. The genome nails down what proteins every cell gets to have. It's like the specifications for the aluminum and the, um, you know, and the, and the copper and everything, and the silicon, everything else in your computer. That, that's very important. Hardware is really important. If you don't have the right hardware, you got nothing. But, but we all know that trying to infer what your computer is going to do from a description of the materials that go into it is really tough. And that there are other levels of description that are very useful, for example, the, um, the software level of, of description. So what happens is that uh, some of that hardware is, is electrically active, there are ion channels, gap junctions. And if you have a sheet of cells that have that hardware, that sheet has some amazing properties. It becomes an excitable medium that can do interesting things like break symmetry, hold memories, um, do computations, pattern recognition, th th those kinds of things. All of that rides on, wh where does that come from? People say, well, it's ultimately in the DNA, isn't it? It's the same problem as if I give you a couple of transistors and you make, uh, you make a, a, a logic gate out of it, and, and the logic gate has a little truth table, right, that does logic, and you say, well, where's the truth table? Well, where is the truth table? It's, you know, it's, a, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's a, you know, mathematicians uh, that can debate this stuff. You know, where are the truths of mathematics? Well, the, the truth table for that logic gate is not in the hardware description of your uh, transistor, okay? It is, what, what happened is that you, your, the hardware that you made is able to manifest some laws of physics and laws of computation that are really cool. Evolution takes advantage of this all the time. It makes hardware like ion channels in other, you know, in other areas like um, sticky proteins let you harness the laws of adhesion and things like that. There's all kinds of cool emergent properties when you have differential adhesion. So, so what you can do is you can make a machine and what evolution does is specifies the seed for a machine that harnesses laws of physics and computation. They're not, it's not in the DNA. It's, and this is true for, for many different machines. Um, you know, think of, uh, think of a, a triangle, right? You know, you, we, we know what the angles of a triangle add up to. If you evolve two angles of that triangle, you don't need to evolve the third. You already know what it is. Why is that? Where does that come from, right? You don't need to have that in your DNA. That's, that's a gift for free from physics. And, and, and physics gives you lots more and, and computation gives you lots more gifts, for example, logic and logic gates and, and, and things like this. So, um, so, so, so it's, very, it's very interesting to think about for a given piece of hardware, what software can it run? So I'm just gonna give you a couple of interesting examples, practical examples. One, one example is you have a, a flatworm, it's a planarian. These flatworms, um, they have lots of interesting properties. Uh, they, they're, 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 they're interestingly advanced animals. They have a true brain. They have a nerve cord. They have, in fact, two nerve cords, uh, bilateral symmetry. They're, they're similar to our direct ancestor. And one of the properties they have is that if you chop them into pieces, and the record is like 270-something pieces, every piece knows exactly what's missing will regrow exactly what you need to be a perfect little worm. And by the way, while it's growing, let's say you chop it in thirds, and you take that middle fragment, over in, in eight days, it will grow a new head and a new tail. During that time, actually, the middle shrinks so that it's perfectly proportioned because the head and tail are going to be small. Well, you don't want to be out of proportion. So, so the middle shrinks, the, the other stuff grows, and you get a perfect little worm. Not only are they highly regenerative, but they're immortal. They have no lifespan limit. There's no such thing as an old planarian. They live forever. So they're telling us, I mean, it's basically an existence proof that you can be, uh, and, and by the way, they're smart. They can learn. So, so this is telling you that you can be a complex uh, organism with, with some measure of intelligence and live forever. It's very interesting. So, um, okay, so we asked a simple, we asked a simple question. Um, how does this piece know where the head and the tail goes? And in fact, how does it know how many heads it's supposed to have? And uh, now, now that now that is a question that if if you were starting for see this is this is where it starts to make a difference what your um, what your outlook is if your outlook is that the genetics specifies anatomy this is a question you would never ask it's a dumb question of course well, how, what do you mean how you, you, you does the cells just follow the rules in the DNA and whatever is gets made what gets made and it happens to be one head one tail because that's what evolution picked up right so it's obvious yeah. so okay. Um, so we said, well, let's let's see. So 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 one of the things we did was we used this technology that uh, that we worked out, which is uh, voltage sensitive fluorescent dyes. So you soak this animal in uh, in this in this chemical, and it basically fluoresces based on uh, based on the local uh, the local voltage gradient. And what you see is something very interesting that 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 worms and and in fact pieces of a worm have a particular bioelectrical pattern that 
indicates that that we now can decode that indicates make one head and we said well isn't that interesting what happens if we artificially change that pattern now the way you change that bioelectrical pattern is you can open and close certain ion channels you can do it in, in planaria the easiest way to do it is with drugs that open and close these channels so no genetic modification you don't touch the actual hardware spec you don't edit the genome but you temporarily modify the ion channel state so that the electrical circuit shifts to a different state think about a think about a flip-flop you got a flip-flop and you turn on the juice and uh, the current is going in one half of the flip-flop and you call that a zero, you come along and you temporarily hold a high voltage to one of the one of the elements, the thing switches, now it's going around the other side of it, and now you call it a one. What's interesting is that um, the, the information state of that flip-flop, you cannot read out from looking at the hardware. You could take an x-ray of it, you see all the same transistors, nothing's changed, Why? What? how do you read the information? That's very important because all of the tools, you know, but you know, proteomics, transcriptomics, all of that stuff works in the dead state. You can kill a cell, take it apart into pieces, count all the genes, count all the proteins. Bioelectricity doesn't work like that. It, it's, it's gone. The minute the cell dies, it's all gone. So, so the information is not in the hardware. You can't see. This is, why, this is why we need physiomics. You cannot infer electrical state from any molecular biology data. It's a completely separate layer. It's not completely separate. It's linked, but, but it's, a, it's a distinct layer of information. Okay. So, uh, so we said, okay, what if we leave the hardware entirely alone? What if we take seriously the idea that, that biological hardware is reprogrammable? And what we're going to do is we're just going to rewrite a different information into it. And all of this uh, came from, again, uh, a way of thinking about it where we said d development could, in theory, be this kind of feed forward sort of open loop emergent process where lots of cells do you know simple rules you know kind of like cellular automata right lots of cells do simple things and out you know emergence you know this complex thing i mean of course there are examples of complexity emerging from simple rules but it's actually much more clever than that because we know that if you deviate it if you damage it if you cut an embryo in half you get monozygotic twins you don't get half embryos if you cut a limb it'll regenerate the limb and there are many amazing examples of what, of what the biology can do so it's much more clever than that so we said what if it is a, a loop of anatomical homeostasis what if the system literally represents the anatomical goal state and when it's deviated from that state with injury with um mutations with what, what pathogens whatever uh, it will exert work to try to get back to that state. Now, that's a, that's a very weird model. On the one hand, okay, biologists, of course, everybody knows about feedback loops, right? They're everywhere. But, but biologists are used to two things, feedback loops that are simple scalars, like pH, for example, single numbers. Or, and the other thing they're used to is uh, uh, models that don't talk about goals, right? Uh, you know, bi bi biochemistry isn't supposed to have a goal. It's just supposed to sort of roll forward and whatever happens, happens. Now, now, if you if if since the '40s we've had the science of cybernetics, so now goals are no longer scary. They don't have to be magical. They're not, we, you know, there are we we're surrounded by objects with goal states. It's fine. It's you know, it's not scary. So so we said, okay, what if? Um, well, let's get some insight how, from let's get a, a, a you know, kind of inspiration. How does the brain store goals? We know we have goals. How do we store goals? Well, presumably in the electrical activity of our of our neurons. So could it be that this electrical pattern in the planarian? is literally what we're seeing is a memory it's 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 like it's like what the neural decoding people are trying to do they're trying to look at the electrical pattern and decode the memories if we take seriously the idea that this is a collective intelligence it should be storing its representation of what a correct planarian is supposed to look like if it's going to do that how is it going to store that well uh the way the brain stores it it'll be an electrical pattern why not let's take a look again all of these things you would never do any of this stuff if you didn't take seriously the idea that it was a goal-seeking system right so we use the drugs, we, re we, we, we alter the bioelectric pattern, we make models of the, of the circuit, what would it take to make it bilaterally, uh, you know, uh, to make, make a two-head two pattern, we create it, guess what the cells build, they build a two-headed two worm. If you were to, uh, these two-headed worms, perfectly viable, I've got videos of them uh, running around and, and you know, being two-headed worms, um, if, if, uh, if you were to, uh, if you were to uh, sequence their genomes, you would have zero clue that they're two-headed worms. It's not in the genome. There's nothing in there. There's nothing wrong with the genome. So the, uh, so the hardware says nothing about the software, basically. That's correct. That's correct. That what, what the hardware, what the hardware, I mean, you can, you can cut that really finely. You can say, well, there is this difference in the hardware, for example, because there are twice as many um, uh, eye genes turned on because, because you needed to make two eyes. Okay. That's, you know, that's a little, um, 
that's 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 but 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 we have to acknowledge that uh but but the actual hardware uh you can't read from that how many you know from the dna how many heads it has now it has it has another amazing property which is that like any good uh like any good uh, memory medium it stores the information that you put in there so when you cut a two-headed worm in plain water with no more manipulations of any kind you will continue to get two-headed worms even though the so now so now there's an interesting philosophical question what determines the number of heads in a flatworm now the answer is no longer the dna however what you do know is that the dna determines hardware that has a default behavior it, it when you first turn on the juice by default it will make exactly one head reliably very reliably but it has this other it's it, and so and so we should this shouldn't freak anybody out if, if you've ever seen a programmable calculator you turn it on it always says zero when you turn it on super reliable that's what it's supposed to do right but you know full well that you could now ha after that you could do all kinds of things with it if the end right and and maybe even make it remember certain things right this got a memory no no problem uh that's 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 the analogy here the analogy is that what what evolution does and there we can we can say some more interesting things about it but what what evolution does is it chooses components that by default the hardware has a base a base state but the hardware is actually really clever and that cleverness is masked until you start perturbing the system you don't see it you don't see it until you start stressing it in various weird ways. And now you start to see it solve problems, have memories. And, we, and now we can even, you know what I mean? The thing is, we, we steal pretty much all of our uh, technology and many of our approaches from neuroscience. This is very important. The tools of neuroscience cannot distinguish what we do from, from traditional neuroscience because there is no fundamental difference. All the same stuff, pharmacology, um, uh, neurotransmitter chemistry, optogenetics, uh, the models that are used in, in cognitive science and computational psychiatry, all of those things work perfectly well in the rest of the body. They do not distinguish this at all. And so that's, that's, you know, that's an important um, kind of hardware software distinction to the point where, uh, just, just the, the, you know, one, one more piece to this, it's one thing to ask the planarian to, to build an extra head that it already knows how to build. We had another paper. This was this was an amazing uh, finding by an under. This was an undergrad in our in our lab who who wrote this paper. Uh, she found that you could you could the 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 electrical circuit that determines uh, how many heads you have is has a state space that has a bunch of different attractors. You can knock the animal without any genetic editing. You can knock the animal into an attractor that belongs to a different species. So what she did was she cut the heads off of these worms, and they have they have like sort of sort of soft roundish heads. And she was able to see head shapes, including brain shapes and everything else, that belong to other species of planaria that are between 100 and 150 million years different. Again, invisible to the genetics. So, so again, you've got hardware that, uh, you know, by default, it's, it runs this algorithm. But it's perfectly capable of running other algorithms if you know how to shift it into that direction. And you don't shift it by getting your soldering iron and rewiring it the way molecular medicine does today, where we go after the DNA and the protein design and all that, you shift it to a different attractor with inputs, with stimuli, with signals that you give it, not by rewiring the hardware. It's a very powerful um, tool that we can, we can take away from computer science and use for, for, for medicine, for regenerative medicine. When you say she can see these various, these millions of other options, how exactly do you see these? Like what oh, you see the you, you see the actual species form so mm -hmm. you see the actual head shapes so you take you take a you take a planarian with a particular head shape you you use a ion channel a blocker to um or a gap junctional blocker to uh prevent the cells from uh achieving their normal electrical distribution mm -hmm. you do that for about 48 hours then you pull the drug out they settle back down to an electrical distribution seven or eight percent of the time they go back to normal to the correct shape the rest of the percentages, these animals will will regrow heads that look like they belong to other species. They just physically the worms. You look at the worm and it has the head shape of a completely different species. Because you know they come, they can be triangular, flat, round. There's all kinds of head shapes. We've done it with frog too. You can make tadpoles that have round tails like zebrafish um, that have faces like different, like the wrong species of frog. Um, yeah, and uh, you, I mean you can you can just you can just see it, and so. Uh, and then you can look at the shape of the brain and you can see that it belongs to this, to, to these other species. 
And, and so, so that's one example. And then an, an, another, a, a really, a, a more recent, you know, I think very powerful example of the hardware and software kind of duality. Um, we know n normal, and this sort of harkens back to my, to my uh, idea about um, uh, chimeras and, and why that's important. We are, com we are totally uh, lulled into a false sense of security by the reliability of development, the fact that acorns make oak trees and zebrafish make uh, zebrafish eggs make zebrafish, um, it's it sort of seems obvious, expected, and so on. We forget that a from looking at the genome, you can't tell what it's going to be. You can cheat and compare it to other genomes that you know what it is, but you can't. But if you don't have that information, you can't look at a genome and, and give and you know and know know what the you know what the uh, what the shape and the and the symmetry type and everything else. Uh, and if you were to imagine, if you were to scale yourself down to the level of a single cell and stand inside an embryo, if you didn't already know what embryonic development was, and you saw all these cells zipping around and a bunch of them are dying and it's all noisy every time you look, it's a different set of cells, you would never in a million years know that, hey, every single time this thing's going to make a beautiful frog. You, you would just, you, you, would, you would never know that. Mm -hmm. So, 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 so we asked an interesting question. Imagine, imagine a frog embryo and a frog embryo has some skin. Uh, skin cells and the skin cells sit around the outside and you look at that and you say okay clearly what these cells in their natural habitat do is they have this really boring two-dimensional life on the outside of the animal they just sit there and, and keep out the pathogens so we did an interesting experiment we took some of these skin cells off of the frog embryo we set them aside in a separate little little compartment that's it we don't add new genes we don't add nanomaterials. We, we don't do anything else. What we do, though, is take away something. What do we take away? We take away the instructive inter, in, in, um, uh, influence of the rest of the embryo, the, the other cells. And we give them a chance to re-explore, sort of their, re-establish their multicellularity. You're on your own now. What do you want to do? Now, here are, of course, of course, uh, some people after we showed this, which, which uh, some people said, well, uh, you know, that uh, we knew that would happen. Yeah, right. Uh, uh, after everything's obvious afterwards, but, but, but in the, in the, um, uh, at, at the, at the beginning of the experiment, if I say to you, I'm going to take a bunch of skin cells off of this animal, what are they going to do? Well, they could die because they're in the wrong environment and they don't have the right neighbors. They could, uh, uh, sort of just disperse throughout the dish. They could form a monolayer, like a cell culture. They could do absolutely nothing and just sit. There's many things they could do. Instead, what they do is they join together into a into a, a little ball of a, of a particular shape. The cilia, the little moving hairs that they have, it used to be the, the cilia was for um, redistributing the mucus off, off around the surface of the of the animal, right? So they sort of just make the mucus flow. They use those cilia to row against the water, and the thing starts running around. It starts moving. We call them xenobots. It's a, if you haven't seen these videos, they're they're unbelievable. It's a it's a it's a little it's a it's a little proto proto animal that swims around. They do mazes. They cooperate in groups. They um, heal damage. Uh, they have all kinds of amazing uh, behaviors. They have if you do calcium imaging on them, they they look exactly like a brain. There's a, there's a lot of um, you know very interesting calcium flashing. There's no neurons in. There's just skin. It's just skin. There's nothing else. So. So now this is interesting in, in, in a number of ways. First of all, if you were to sequence the genome, you would, you would have absolutely no clue that that's what, you ha that's, that's what you're looking at. You would say standard tadpole. In fact, um, uh, you know, it, what, what we're seeing is that actually the frog genome can make at least one of two different things. It can make, it, it can make a tadpole or it can make a xenobot. And the other thing, and, and they do, here's another amazing thing they do. Uh, because we've made it impossible for them to reproduce in their normal way that frogs reproduce, if you give them loose cells in the dish, you just sprinkle a bunch of loose uh, skin cells, they will run around, collect those loose cells into little piles, compact them into the piles. Guess what the piles become? They become the next generation of xenobots, and those start running around and repeat the cycle. So this is, this is von Neumann's uh, kinematic self-replication when when the machine runs around and finds parts and makes a copy of itself right so they do this they, they, this no other animal that we know of does this they figured this out in 48 hours so right so so the same hardware in a different environment is able is capable of completely different morphogenesis and behavior so now what we see is that apparently what evolution gives you when it makes a frog genome a xenopus genome is it doesn't it, it hasn't it doesn't give you a solution to 
how to be a great frog in a particular froggy environment, which is a standard story of evolution, you know, selection. There's never been selection to be a great xenobot. There's never been any xenobots. It's, it's completely f from scratch. What evolution actually does, and this is one of the most exciting sort of topics for, for future research, is how it generalizes, the learning process of evolution generalizes to say that, no, my ge the, this genome is actually good at creating robust organisms under a range of unexpected environmental conditions. Not just the environment, but actually the, the components are different now. And so you can't rely on having cells that, that for millions of years you knew you had these cells, but you don't have them anymore. Now what do you do? So, so, so evolution makes problem-solving machines. It doesn't make solutions. It mm -hmm. makes problem-solving machines. And, uh, and, and that's another distinction. You know, that, that's, that, that's the amazing, that's what's amazing about this hardware is that it's a, it's a problem solving machine. It's not a, a, a hardwired, you know, sort of solution like the machines we make, which are basically single purpose. They tend to be single purpose things. The name Xenobot, I mean, it's named after the African cloth frog, I think. Correct. That's where these cells came from. Although, although we've now, there's nothing froggy unique about this. We've now made them out of all kinds of other cells. Have, uh, have you tried this? How many other species have you guys tried this on? Um, a few, uh, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not going to go into the details because, uh, the, the, this, this stuff is not yet uh, published and peer reviewed. So, um, keep, 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 keep an eye out this, this summer, there should be something out this summer that will, uh, you know, kind of uh, tell the next, uh, the next chapter of this story. There's so much to digest here. I mean, like how, when we apply this to humans, I mean, what are we going to get? What are we going to get? What are your thoughts on that? If we have to apply some of these um experiments on humans what do you think might happen yeah yeah well we are i mean we've been for, for for some years with david kaplan's lab we've been doing this with um uh, adult human tissues uh, for regenerative purposes we have a, so so if i'm going to talk about that i should say um this is a, a disclosure uh you know financial disclosure that i have uh, D david and i have a company uh, morphoceuticals inc that's basically about taking what we've learned. I mean, we've induced, we've, we've, we've created eyes out of stomach cells in frog. We've made, uh, we've normalized tumors. We've induced leg regeneration, um, craniofacial fixed brain and craniofacial defects. There's, there's a huge set of applications for biomedicine. So, so, so Morphoceuticals Inc. is about taking what we've learned about manipulating uh, uh, regenerative processes in, in, in the frog model and doing it in, in, in mammals. So we start with mice and eventually human patients. And so the goal of, the goal of all of this is is regenerative medicine because we are all fundamentally the same uh, you know the, the pe people talk about the complexity difference between frog and human but it's not at this level it is nothing that different it's it's all going to be the same stuff yes it's like philosophically as well i mean when you look at how we always try and take ourselves and put ourselves on the pedestal i mean humans uh, on top of the food chain and then darwin comes just knocks us down i mean this is clearly an example of taking us down a little bit um, um I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't say down. I would say that it is, it is absolutely true that in the current, th think of, think of the space of all possible agents. And we're talking about every conceivable combination of evolved material, design material, and software. Okay. So all the weird high cyborgs and high brats and, 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 you know, weird engineer, like this giant space of possible creatures. There is a very there's a very thin subspace of that a subset of that space which are which is the way that the phylogenetic tree here on Earth that that's how that's what life has done here on Earth. It is true that it, right now in that phylogenetic uh, subset of that of that space we have some some unique capacities that others don't have. But that is a total accident of it's it's a it's an accident of the meandering path of evolution on this one planet. There is nothing fundamental about it. If we look around us, that space, uh, that space is enormous, and we are going to be exploring it with various uh, modifications, uh, you know, implants and 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 bioelectric and genetic and other other uh, implications um, of of all of this plasticity. We we are definitely terrible at seeing intelligence in other guises, so that's for sure. We need to get way better at that. Um, and we have to realize that as much as we understand what diminished capacity is, you know, anything less than a standard human, whatever that is, uh, clearly there's no reason to think that we are at the limit of what's possible. So, so well, what's enhanced capacity look like? What does a creature look like? Imagine, um, and we can, uh, unfortunately, I'm going to have to go in about three minutes, but um, I, I have a whole framework based on the size of your goals as a way to understand your cognitive sophistication. Imagine, imagine a creature 
uh, that uh, to who that that can literally in the linear range when when something let's say let's be positive let's say something nice happens to 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 a hundred a hundred people and then something something nice happens to you know ten thousand people that that creature is literally a hundred times happier for them right I mean we can't do that we have right we have we have a very very limited linear range after a while it's just like yeah that's great or yeah isn't that terrible you know uh, uh, lots of you know whatever uh, lots of people having this this t- tough time I mean that's bad but it's not a thousand times worse than if it was one person right we, we flatten out imagine a creature and and you might you know we can get um inspiration from this from from literature for example in the buddhist literature they talk about expanding your consciousness to the point where you actually literally care about uh this this immense sphere of of sentient creatures like imagine someday somebody you know we will engineer a being that has i don't know how many hemispheres of a brain they're going to have i don't know how big it's going to be they'll have you know they'll be plugged into uh, to, to the internet and god knows what else and maybe that and, and that creature t- will have so much more moral capacity and from the perspective of that creature, we, you know, when we go to court and they say, well, you've only got the two, the two hemispheres, what could you expect? You, you, you can't, you know, you don't have that much uh, competency, you know, for you, we don't expect that much from you, but, 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 but the rest of us, um, we, we have this, we have this incredible moral capacity. We have to, we're responsible for all, but so much more responsible, right? For you know, in a moral sense. So I think, I think it's crazy to think that, uh, that, that humans are the top of the, right now they might be the top of a certain kind of a food chain, but that's not going to last, you know. Mike, there's 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 too many things to discuss, and I know we just we we're running out of time here. I just want to say thank you so much. I know I ran a bit late. I was at work, and we had a whole no mess up with the shade with our schedules. But I really appreciate your time. I hope we get to have around to. There's so many more philosophical questions that I think tie into the mind body problem here that we can discuss. Sure. sure. And I appreciate uh, this chat. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, Great discussion. I'm happy to come back and get to whatever we didn't get to. So thank you.